and today I'm going to talk about uh, attention. I'm using some vocabulary from physics, the quarks of attention, but uh, it's really about the fundamental building blocks of attention in the same way that quarks are the fundamental building blocks of, uh, of other particles. So this is the outline of my talk. First, I'm going to give a, a general introduction to attention, the problem of attention within the, what I call the standard model, uh, borrowing again some, some language from physics. You will see uh, very shortly what I mean by standard model. Uh, then I will try to organize all possible attention mechanisms uh, in a systematic way and provide uh, some kind of taxonomy. I will then explain how attention works in transformers, which uh, are uh, an important architecture in, in deep learning these days. I will demonstrate some applications of attentions and in particular of transformers to, to um, some interesting problems. And then I will finish by showing you how you can begin to develop a mathematical theory of attention. So let me uh, start from the beginning. What is attention? Of course, every one of us knows, at least in, a, in an intuitive way, what attention is. It has been studied by psychologists for uh, quite some time. So you see here the definition uh, uh, provided by, by James in the late uh, 1800s. Um, in fact, it's, it's not obvious that, that there is something called attention, right? Unless you, 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 you start uh, focusing on it. And also you see here two other definitions, for instance, the concentration of, of awareness on some phenomenon to the exclusion of other stimuli. So broadly speaking, it's this idea that the brain somehow has this amazing ability to concentrate its uh, computational power for lack of a better word, we, we don't know exactly how it works, but to concentrate its resources on a particular uh, stimulus in the sensory system, whether it's a visual system or a visual stimulus or auditory st stimulus, for instance, or also on some internal representation, on some thought. Uh, Obviously, if you're trying, let's say, to prove a mathematical theorem, uh, you need a lot of concentration and you have to focus your attention on internal representation of mathematical concepts and so on and so forth. So that's the intuitive idea of attention. And of course, there is a question of how does it really work? And uh, one way to study this problem, of course, is to go into neuroscience. And neuroscientists have been studying attention for a while. And uh, the conclusion is that it's a, it's a very complex uh, phenomenon. And in fact, it's not a single thing. It's not a singular term. It is a variety of uh, different processes and mechanisms as described in this, uh, in this quote. So it is, uh, there has certainly been progress, but it's a, it's a very complex biological phenomenon. So what we're going to do instead is to study attention within artificial neural networks, which is, uh, which is deep learning. And most of all, I'm going to focus on what uh, should be the fundamental building blocks of attention, um, regardless of, less of whether it is say visual attention, auditory attention, or some other kind of attention. I think all these ideas, different types of attention at their core, have a, a certain basic mechanisms that we're going to try to identify. In particular, when we say um, that uh, it is at the exclusion of all other stimuli, this exclusion of all other stimuli means some kind of inhibition, right? It means that you are multiplying by zero, essentially, all the other stimuli so that you can concentrate on, on what you're interested in, right? And maybe you're also enhancing what you're concentrating in. So it means that you must be able to multiply by zero certain things and enhance, which is multiplied by say a factor of two or three, the thing that you're interested in. 
So already there, you get an intuition that there is something, one, one, one possible direction is to think that there is something multiplicative about attention where you can multiply things by zero and inhibit them, suppress them. And then you can also multiply what you're interested in, enhance it by some, some other factor. So that's a sort of a thinking or idea uh, we, we, we're going to develop. Now we're going to do this in artificial neural networks, in particular in what I call, I'm going to call the standard model. And what is the standard model? Well, uh, if you attended my tutorial yesterday, um, the standard model is just the basic model for artificial neural networks where a, a, an artificial neural network is a network of very simple computing devices, which go back to McCulloch and Pitts, uh, very simple model neurons, if you want, where a neuron is a computing device that operates by first taking the dot product of the incoming signal X with the weights W, the synaptic weights of the neuron. So you have a weighted average, which is called the activation of the neuron. And then this activation is sent through a, an activation or transfer function to produce an output. And you have all kinds of activation functions, such as sigmoidal uh, activation function, tan H and, and the logistic function, or you can have a threshold function like the heavy side or the sine function, or you can have a piecewise linear function like ReLU and so forth, right? But this is what I call the standard model. Some of the mechanisms we're going to see are outside this definition of the standard model are new additions to the standard model. And it's important to keep in mind that the standard model, it's well known that the standard model has universal approximation properties in the sense that for instance, every Boolean function is in the standard model. We're using linear threshold gates and every continuous function over a compact set, real valued function over a compact set can be approximated within epsilon by a circuit, by a network uh, that belongs to the standard model. It's, it's very easy to show that. So whatever attention is or what we're going to do attention, it's not about being able to compute functions, new functions that you cannot do with the standard model. Everything can be done within the standard model. It's all about doing things in more efficient ways with less layers and things like that, right? but it's not about exist existential questions of, of uh, what functions can be approximated with or without attention. Okay. Now it turns out of course, that uh, uh, attention has actually been a very popular topic in deep learning over the past 10 years, especially um, coming from the field of uh, natural language processing of NLP where people have been developing all kinds of uh, so-called attention mechanisms in a sort of uh, ad hoc fashion, but in, in, in ways that have been very powerful for the applications. And the idea, the basic idea in uh, natural language processing uh, and applications of attentions in, in, in NLP is um, represented in, in this uh, picture where you have at the bottom a sentence in English, how was your day? And then a translation in French, which actually is not very a good one, but I, I downloaded this from the web, comment se passe la journée, right? And the idea is that whatever the, the processing you're doing to translate from English to French, when you're trying to produce a word at position T in the output, you are um, looking at the words in the input, but with some kind of weighting scheme where certain words are more important than others, okay? Of course, when you're trying to produce the word journée, which means day in, in, in French, the word day in English is the most important one in the sentence, and then the other ones have, have less importance. In this case, um, you know, it's the same position, it's the last word in the sentence, but of course, uh, as you change languages or, or sentence types, the, the, you don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the location of, of words in the input sequence, of course, and, 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 the, same, and the same position in the, in the output sequence, notwithstanding that the sequence would have different length as in this case, right? But you see this idea of, of, of attention, the ability to switch 
the importance that you give to the various uh, um, streams of information that are coming through, through the deep learning system, right? So that's the idea that people have been implementing in natural language processing. There has been over the last decade, a series of, of important uh, publications on this topic. I've just listed a few of them here. I have no time to go through them. But the, the important thing is that the sort of uh, pinnacle of this, uh, of this uh, movement, of this trend in, in NLP, is what are called transformer architectures, which are widely uh, used today, which have led to the state-of-the-art results in LLP problems, in translation and other problems. Um, this is what is used by all the large companies, uh, Googles and so forth. And um, these uh, architectures are now implemented in the standard software frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch. So they are, they are very widely used for, for natural language processing, but now they're also making their way into other areas. And I'll give you example of that. I'll give you examples of application of uh, transformers to problems, uh, for instance, in physics and uh, explain why now they are, they are making their way into other areas in, in, uh, in very interesting uh, manner. If you read a paper about uh, transformer, you will see diagram of this kind and uh, you know new vocabulary about uh, query key and value vectors. If you're not in the NLP field, that, that, that will look a little bit strange. There will be a matrix uh, operation, etc. So it's not clear if you read them, if you glance through such paper, it's not even clear that it's a neural network, right? It's not, they do not draw neural networks. And um, what I will try to do is to unpack these architectures for those of you who have not really uh, studied them in detail and show you how you can draw them, in fact, as a neural network. And, um, and then we will identify where the so-called attention mechanisms that they use are inside these uh, uh, neural networks. All right. So let's try to organize now the fundamental building block of attention mechanisms, whatever attention may be. And uh, what I'm going to do to do, in order to do that, I'm going to think in the following way. In the standard model that I described, there is three types of variables. You have the activation of the neurons, you have the output of the neurons and you have the synaptic weights. So you have S, O, and Ws. That's the only variables that are used in, 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 this, uh, in, this, uh, in the standard model. You could even say that the activation and the output are redundant if the, if the activation function is one-to-one, -one, right? But let's imagine you have three variable types, three types of variables, activation, outputs, and synaptic weights. I'm going to try to classify all possible signals, whatever attention signal, whatever, whatever they are, according to the origin of the signal. So you, when you have attention, you have an attention signal that is generated somewhere. I'm going to assume that it could be in, 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 in the activations of neurons. It could be in the outputs of neurons. Maybe it could be in the synaptic ways. So you have three possibilities. And then these attending signals have to reach their target. And again, the target could be of type S O or W. You could even think about mixed schemes where the origin of the attending signal is both into in the output maybe and the synaptic weights of some neurons. But that's a little bit uh, strange and, and, uh, and would of course create more cases. So I'm going to stick to these sort of homogeneous cases where the source of the signal is of one type and the target of the signal is of another type, okay? And then you have to specify how the signal, the attending signal interacts with this target. And already in the introduction, I suggested that multiplication is likely to be um, a fundamental uh, mechanism for attention. So we're going to look at multiplication. But in order to be uh, complete, so systematic in some way, we're also going to look at additive interaction. Let's see what happens if we allow addition also to be one of the interaction 
the two interaction uh, mechanisms. And so if you look at all these possible cases, you, you get 18 cases, right, that you can study one by one, and it's an interesting thing. But already I'm going to shrink it down to six possibilities by making the assumption that the origin of the signal comes from the output of some neurons. So I'm assuming that there are some neurons in the um, attention uh, mechanism that produces an output, and that's the attention signal. And this output then is going to interact with either S, O, or W variables, either multiplicatively or additively. Okay, so we have six possibilities. We have reduced things to six possibility, and they are listed here, where um, you have two mechanisms, either it's through addition or multiplication, and then you have three targets, the activations of some neurons or the outputs of some neurons or the synapses of some neurons, okay? Now, I'm not going to go all three, uh, all six cases because not all of them are interesting and some of them can be reduced to the others. But the three that are very important and that I'm going to use in the rest of the talk are what I call activation attention, where it's an additive mechanism that are, is targeting the activations of some neuron. So this means that there are some neurons, the attending neurons, they produce some outputs, and these outputs are added to the activation of some other neurons. Now, of course, this is nothing new. It's just part of the standard model. But the reason why this is important is because that is also one possible mechanism for inhibiting other neurons and doing the exclusion of other stimuli operation that is essential for attention. Now, this happens when you have, let's say, sigmoidal neurons. If the attending neurons send a very large negative signal to, to, to the attended neurons that have sigmoidal uh, activation function, of course, if you get a very large negative uh, input, let's say you have a logistic, the output is going to be zero, right? So one way of inhibiting neurons, those that should not be part of the attention mechanism, is by sending them a very large negative signal in the normal way within the standard model and, and, and shutting them down in that way. So that's why I'm, I'm including this additive mechanism in the list. It turns out that I'm not going to uh, talk about it very much in the rest of the talk because it's part of the standard model, it's nothing new. But in the mathematical proofs of the theorems, uh, very strangely, in a way that I don't completely understand, this mechanism comes up in the proof themselves to prove the theorems about the other two mechanisms, which are new. So the other two mechanisms that I'm going to talk about are multiplicative, uh, just like our intuition uh, sort of suggested. And it's basically either the ability of some neurons to uh, combine their outputs with the output of other neurons in a multiplicative way. So in the most simple case, a neuron produces an output and it has the ability of, mul of uh, multiplying uh, the value of the target of the attending neuron output with its value. Or you have synaptic attention where again, the output of some neuron can be used to multiply now the synapses of some other neurons. And this is very much in the framework, uh, in, in, the, in the, you know, the language of electrical engineering, it's really gating, right? It's gating the output or gating the synaptic weights of other neurons. I'm going to show them in, in a sort of enlarging things. So here is the output gating. What I mean by that is you have an attending neuron, here's neuron I, which is being attended by neuron J. The output of neuron J is the attention signal. And you see this output comes here and it multiplies the output of neuron I. So this is outside of the standard model. It's this new algebraic operation where you allow neurons to multiply their outputs. And then of course, this multiplied output or I or J travels along the axon of neuron I towards say a target, a neuron K here, which is going to receive as input this term here, which now of course is quadratic, right? So this is new in the standard model. You start seeing these new quadratic terms appearing inside the neural network. Synaptic gating is, is uh, similar, but now the attending neuron produces an output OJ, which multiplies 
the synaptic weights. So this is, goes with the idea of the fast synaptic weights in neural networks, having weights with different time scales. But in this case, you have weights that can be modified on, on a rapid time scale compared to learning uh, by the activity of the attending neurons, right? Note that when you reach the neuron K, what gets there is the same thing. It's the same thing in both cases. It's this new quadratic terms. But of course, this mechanism is, there, is are different. And if you look at what happens on, uh, on uh, different uh, axons emanating from neuron I, or at least a different connection, I should say, emanating from neuron I, in this case, you could assume that OIOJ is broadcasted everywhere to all the neurons which are downstream of neuron I. Whereas here, it's a more precise mechanism that affects only this connection between neuron I and neuron K. You don't have a broadcasting on, on all other connections. But both mechanisms are, are quite interesting, can be added to the standard model. And this is exactly what happens in transformers. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to move to transformers. As I told you, this is the sort of uh, uh, creme de la creme of, of attention architectures currently. And I'm going to, to unpack them in, in, and show you how is the layout from a neural network point of view and show you where attention comes in and show you that it's exactly the type of mechanism that I just described, which is the multiplication of outputs by outputs or multiplication of synaptic weights by, by outputs, okay? So if you read the literature on transformers, they are made of uh, basically building blocks and coder blocks, decoder blocks, but each one of these blocks has roughly the architecture that is described here, which have been tried to lay out as a neural network. And the idea is this, you have uh, inputs in this block, which you should think about of as vectors. For instance, in the, in the first uh, layer, these vectors could be representing the words in the incoming se sequence using something like a word to vec, some embedding of words into, into vectors, all right? So these are the different vectors representing the different words in the sequence. And then there is a, a, a circuit, uh, let's say just a, a one layer of weights that is transforming this vector here into three vectors, which are called Q, K, and V, the query, the key, and the value vector. But these are just names. So the, the, this vector here is transformed in one layer into uh, three vectors, Q, K, and V. And then there is weight sharing. So the same circuit, the same weights are reused at every position to produce these three vectors, right? So very simple initial stage. Then here you have the, what they call the attention mechanisms, which is just taking all possible pairwise dot products between all Q vectors and all K vectors, right? So if you have uh, n words, if the sequence has length n, you are taking n squared dot products between all the q and all the k vectors, all right? And then you apply a softmax to the rows of this, uh, of this matrix where you have put all these dot products. And you use the softmax to change the, the value of the weights in the top layer. So the top layer is just combine all, combining all the value vectors, right? Using some weights, some synaptic weights, like you do in a neural network. But these weights, again, are modulated by this softmax operation coming from here. So you see where the basic mechanisms come in. First of all, you have to compute the dot products. And when you want to compute, I hope it's in my next, next slide. Oops, uh, let's see. Well, in order to compute the dot product of two vectors, let's say a ve vector X and a vector Y, and let's say that X and Y are the output of some neurons, you have to compute the sum of the X, y, X sub I, Y sub I. So you have to multiply X sub I by Y sub I. You have to multiply the output of two neurons together to compute one component of the dot product and do it again n times and then add them together, right? So computing a dot product is an operation that naturally requires 
multiplying the outputs of two of 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 uh, two neurons or a bunch of neurons in a one to one fashion right so that's where attention mechanisms happens as i told you you can do it without uh, adding anything to the standard model but as i will show you in a few slides you get a circuit that is uh, at least uh, four or five layers deep in order to do that in the in the standard model here in one stage in one layer boom you can compute dot products between vectors and then these, these dot products go through a softmax. This is sort of uh, not new, but the softmax result, the, the resulting weighting scheme, and remember the intuitive picture I had for the translation from English to French, this is where it comes. You have a bunch of weights that are applied to these connections where maybe some V is enhanced and some Vs are suppressed by these weights here. And so you have multiplication of synaptic weights by the output of these neurons, which is the synaptic gating mechanism, right? So in some sense, the transformer used both output gating to compute the, the dot products, the similarity, if you want, it can be viewed as a similarity if the vectors are normalized between the, all the Q, the query vectors and the key vectors. And then it uses synaptic gating to gate these connections and combine the value vectors in a, in a, in a, in a dynamic uh, shifting way uh, controlled by this attention mechanism, these attention weights, okay? So transformer is built out of the, the fundamental building blocks, uh, out of the, the quarks that I just described to you. One thing I want to impress on you that will be important for the applications is a little bit surprising, is that uh, transformers are invariant to permutations of their inputs. This seems a little bit strange because they come from NLP. In NLP, the order of the words in a sentence is, is very important. But surprisingly, um, transformers don't care about the order. They throw it away. And you see it here because if I, if I switch around the inputs, if I permute the inputs, you will get the same permutation in the first even layer because there is weight sharing. So the results will be the same, but permuted in the same way. You will get the same permutation in the, in the dot products, in the soft max. And so the output will be uh, identical, right? So you see that this whole block is invariant to permutation of the inputs. A little bit surprised for, uh, surprising for language, but um, as we shall see, very useful for applications where you need to be invariant to um, permutation of the inputs. So if your inputs are sets rather than sequences, that's exactly the kind of thing you want because you don't care about the order of, of the objects in the input. And so you want to sort of build that in into your architecture. All right. So here you see just the dot product mechanisms. You see a bunch of neurons. The attending neurons produce this output, V1, V2, Vn. These are the attending neurons with, with output X1, X2, Xn. If I allow uh, this new multiplication of V1 with X1, V2 with X2, and Vn with Xn, and then I allow a summation here, this is how I get a, a double product between X and V in a very uh, compact form with this new uh, mechanism. Uh, well, let, let me, you can of course also combine this with softmax, but let me, let me just skip this. Uh, this is, as I told you, you can do dot products within the standard model, but this is the circuit that you need in the SM, in the standard model, if you wanted to do the dot product between U1, U2, U3, let's say, and the vector V of V1, V2, V3, you have to be able to, uh, do these kinds of things where you take the logarithm of u1 and etc. In this first layer, you take the logarithm of everything. Then here you add the logarithms. So you would add the logarithm of u1 with the logarithm of, v, of, of v1 to get these things. Then you would have a neuron with an exponential transfer function that would give you back u1, v1. And then you would add everything at the top to get the dot product, right? So you see you have a circuit with say one, two, three layers or four layers, depending how you count it. And all this gets compacted into 
a much shallower uh, building blocks building block by having uh, output gating mechanisms built in into your network right okay so let me now show you a few applications of uh, of transformers to problems that have nothing to do with language and i'm working now in a few problems in physics as well as in chemistry I'm not, I, I don't have the time to go through uh, these in detail, but just give you the idea. And you see, for instance, in chemistry, you want to predict chemical reactions. So you have something like A plus B gives C plus D, right? The reactant should give some products, A plus B gives C plus D. Now, whether it's A plus B or B plus A, from a chemistry point of view, it's the same thing. You are just at the same reactants, right? So the order is irrelevant when you're doing a chemical reaction. And so that's why transformer uh, are a, a useful technology, a useful type of circuit for chemical prediction. We're using them in physics, in all kinds of problems in physics. I'm going to give you just uh, two examples very quickly. Uh, one is in the problems that come from collider physics of the Large Hadron Collider, for instance where you are uh, colliding uh, protons at very high speeds, close to the, the speed of light, and you get a, a, a shower of particle uh, that is produced around the, the collision point, and these particles, they decay, they are detected by, by the detector, and physics, physicists, of course, think about, in, uh, to, about these things in terms of uh, fine mind diagrams. So you see here partial fine, fine mind diagram of a possible uh, decay um, process. And uh, without going in any of the details of the physics, this is a case where um, at the end of the decay, you get uh, in, in this uh, in this fine di diagram, you get um, six possibilities marked by B, Q, Q, and B prime, Q, Q prime. Uh, this corresponds to matter and antimatter because at this uh, fundamental level, there is symmetry between matter and antimatter. It's not true at the level of the entire universe as we know it, but at the elementary level, there is this fundamental symmetry. So on one branch of the tree, you're getting matter, particle of particles of matter. On the other branch, you have to get the same particle, but the opposite charge corresponding to antimatter. And then you can see that whatever the meaning is for BQ and, and, and B prime Q prime, on one branch of the tree, you have two Qs, which are interchangeable. And you have on the other branch, you have two symmetric Q primes that are also interchangeable. Now, the data that you observe, what these BQs, et cetera, are, in fact, are vectors. So what you are observing are vectors representing, for instance, the momentum of the particles, uh, vectors typically, let's say, of dimension four. So at the level of the, of the observation, you may get a bunch of vector of length four. Ideally, it should be six, but uh, very often you have more than that because you have uh, other, other things, you have garbage, you have noise, whatever. So the input may look something like this, where you have uh, eight vectors of size four. These are called the jets, for instance, eight vectors of size four. And your problem is to match those eight vectors to these three structures. So you have to identify among these eight vectors, uh, which one are sort of garbage vectors that you can throw away. And then you have to identify which one are the B vectors and which one are the Q vectors. And same thing for B prime and Q prime. Now you see immediately that first of all, the order of these vectors means nothing here. So you have a permutation invariance with respect to the order. That's already a good reason for using transformer. And furthermore, in the finer structure, you see that you can permute the two Qs. There is no, no nothing canonical about these two Qs. If I exchange these two vectors, it's the same structure. So you have a permutation invariance at the level of the Qs. 
And then you have also what is called the top symmetry, which is the, the, the symmetry between matter and antimatter. If I call this thing Q prime and, and, and replace this one by Q, it's still a valid tree. You know, there is not a, a canonical decision on which one is Q and which one is Q prime, and, and the same for the for the for the uh, for the beats, right? So plenty of permutations in these problems that are essential and again. Uh, something that can be handled very well with uh, with transformers. There is different levels of symmetry, so you really have to go through the details of our architecture to see how we handle that. But you get the basic idea. Permutation are, are very important. You can uh, permute the inputs, the vectors in any possible way, and so uh, transformers are a very um, very suitable uh, architecture for this kind of problems. These are just some of the results we're getting where we can show that we're much uh, better than the existing methods and especially much faster because the existing methods are looking at all possible assignments of, 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 of jets to, to uh, those uh, three structures. So they are very slow and, and transformers are actually uh, much faster than the, uh, some of the current approaches. So that's just to give you an idea without getting into the details. I'll show you another example at the completely at the other end of the spectrum, which is uh, dealing with the neutron stars, where you have um, you know uh, mathematical models of 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 the universe, which in this drawing have uh, two parameters. Let's say so you have an equation of states with two parameters or four parameters, whatever. Uh, and then from the theory of, of neutron star or nuclear theory, you can derive a curve. Depending on where you are in this space, you obtain a, you obtain a curve that tells you that in the universe, all the neutron star have to be on this curve relating mass and radius, right? So for each point in this space, you get a curve in the mass radius space that corresponds to the universe you live in. Of course, I'm, I'm describing things in the forward direction. Then you can sample neutron stars on, on this line. And uh, you can uh, add uh, nuisance parameters, such as uh, you know, where is the, the, the distance of the neutron star from the point of observation, the temperature, uh, things about dust, et cetera. And then from there, you can produce a spectrum. You can do a simulation that produces the corresponding spectrum in the X-ray channels, uh, spectrum for, for the neutron stars. So of course, in reality, we're going in the reverse. We are observing, we have data about uh, some neutron star, noisy data about neutron star in, in the universe. And you want to go in the reverse direction to try to see where in this parameter space uh, is our universe uh, sitting, right? And so again, your input is the spectrum of, let's say, 20 neutron stars, and there is nothing uh, canonical about the order of these 20 spectra. It's just a bag, a set of 20 spectra. And so again, we're using transformer to go to do the inference from the, from the 20 spectra, or whatever number of spectra you have, back to the parameter of states in these equations. And you can see here the prediction of the first parameter, true value versus predicted value. And then the second, which is quite good. The second parameter, the prediction is, is, is still pretty good, but there is more, more noise. And uh, we're trying to, to reduce the noise in, in this prediction. OK, I'm almost at the end now. Let me very quickly give you a sense of how you can try to build a mathematical theory of, of, of attention. And the tool I'm using to do that is called capacity. It's a tool that we'll be using uh, for quite some time. But the idea is very simple. If you have a class of functions, for instance, all the functions that would be computed by, by a neuron or by uh, an architecture, a certain uh, a neural architecture, you define the capacity as being the volume, the log base two of the volume of all the functions that are, can be computed by, by your architecture, right? So if you're doing uh, working with continuous neurons, you have, of course, to define a notion of volume in, this, uh, in, in a certain uh, measure theoretic sense, if you want. 
but I'm going to work with uh, Boolean neurons with, uh, you know, I'm just going to use neuron that have a, a, a threshold function as their input. So their output is zero, one or minus one, one, right? So linear threshold functions. Then everything become Boolean and discrete. So you can actually count how many functions are in that ball and the log base two of the number of function that you get is what we call the capacity, the cardinal capacity. Now, measuring the volume of this ball is really uh, gives you a sense of how powerful the ball is because the bigger, the, the more powerful, but it's a very crude measure, right? Because what you really want to know is what are the functions that are inside this ball, et cetera, and try to characterize them, which of course is a very complex mathematical problem for say a deep architecture, nobody's able to, to do that. This very, very efficient. But still, the reason why the log base two of the volume or the number of function is particularly important in, the, in, the, in, in terms of neural network is because from Shannon theory, you know that this is the number of bits that you need to specify one of the functions within this ball, right? That's what the log two of uh, the cardinal of A is, the average number of bits needed to select a function within this ball. And if you think about learning, learning is all about taking data information from the training set and using it to choose a function in the ball, the function that does the best approximation, right? You wanna choose this, fun this red function that is the closest to your target function H, which may or may not be inside the ball, but that, that's not important, right? So learning in some way, it's all about extracting information from the data and pushing it into the weights of the neural network in order to select the red function or something similar to the red function, right? And so that's why the capacity is important for, for neural networks. And so the first thing you want to know is what is the capacity of a single neuron on the, of a linear threshold gate? So there you are asking how many different linear threshold gates there are, how many Boolean functions are there that can that are linear separable, right? A Boolean function is just the coloring of the cube of, of vectors of zero and one components into two colors, the plus one class and the minus one class. And if it's a linear threshold gate, it means that there is a hyperplane that separates the, the, the red dots from the blue dots, right? So you're asking of all possible coloring of the cubes with two colors, red and blue, how many such colorings are linearly separable, right? That's the question. So it's a fundamental question about neural networks. It's not very well known, but I think it's one of the most important problems in neural network theory. And in 65, uh, Cover had proved an upper bound of uh, N squared on the, on the capacity of the single neuron. Moroga had a lower bound of uh, one half N squared. So there is a gap. And the gap was actually solved in the late 80s by a Russian mathematician called Zuev, was able to prove that the capacity is n squared. This means that the total number of uh, linear threshold function, Boolean function, is about two to the n squares, n squared, as opposed to the total number of Boolean functions, which is two to the two to the n, right? Where if you have n inputs, n is the number of inputs, right? It makes a lot of sense because n square means that you need n vectors of length n to specify a linear threshold function. And if you write the linear system, you know, you get a sense that this is uh, uh, about the right quantity. You can do the same thing for a um, polynomial threshold function, where you're taking a polynomial of degree d and then uh, threshold, thresholding it uh, to plus one or minus one, for instance. Uh, the upper bound there, and d plus one over d factorial, d is the degree of the polynomial. Uh, this upper bound was actually my PhD thesis in, in the 80s. Um, there was a lower bound derived by Sachs in the 90s. And more recently, Roman Verschining and I were able to prove the same thing, the generalization of the, of the linear case, where you have this, um, basically, the capacity is n to the d plus one over d factorial. So the next question is, how do you apply this to attention? So the most simple case, and I'm just going to show you this most simple case, is to imagine that you have a linear threshold gate here. It's the blue neuron. 
So this is just a, the sum of the W, I, X, I, and then you take the sign of that. So you get an output that is uh, plus one or minus one. You have the red neuron, which is also a linear threshold gate. It's the attending neuron, right? And then you take the product of the output of these two neurons to produce the final output, right? Now it's a little bit different if you're using zero one neurons or one minus or one minus one neurons, because if you're taking zero one neur neurons, taking the product, right, as you see here, is the same thing as doing an end. If you have one one, you get a one. In all the other cases, you get a zero. So it's like doing an end. If instead you're using a minus one one formalism, if you have minus minus or plus plus, you get a plus. And if you have a mixed minus plus or plus minus, you get a minus. So it's more like an XOR or, or the negation of an XOR. So there is a little different there, but it creates two nice, interesting problems. You know that for the first, for the blue neuron, you have two to the N square possibilities, the capacities N square. The same thing for the red neuron, but then what happens when you multiply them together, right? So that's the new mathematical problem that you can try to solve to try to understand how many functions are created, how many Boolean functions are created in this circuit by allowing the multiplication of these two outputs. And that's, of course, just the beginning. You can do it with layers. You can imagine the output of this neuron multiplying the, the synapse of another neuron to do you know, synaptic gating. But you can see how you can start creating all kinds of circuits where you want to compute their capacity. And I'm just going to give you the punchline. In this case, this neuron has capacity n squared. This neuron has capacity n squared. And it turns out that the output, it doesn't matter which one you're using, has also capacity, uh, as, as capacity equal to the sum. So the capacity, the answer to my question is 2n squared up to uh, smaller, smaller terms. That's the capacity of this very simple circuit. You can do the same thing with polynomial gate. You can study all kinds of other circuits, as I said, and that's what we're doing with Roman and deriving all these results. And as I mentioned briefly already, the one you know, surprising thing to me is that the, the key mathematical tool for uh, proving some of this result is actually an attention mechanism, is the first type of attention mechanism that I mentioned, where, which is inside the standard model, where you have a bunch of neurons that are inhibiting and other neurons. I, I don't have time to, to show you that, but we're going to post the, uh, the technical report on, on archive in a few days. It's almost ready. And uh, if you're interested, you can email me or you will see in archive in, in, a, in a few days. So very rapidly, I'm out of time. So my conclusion, I have tried to show you that it's possible to produce a taxonomy of, uh, of uh, attention to, to really try to identify fundamental basic mechanisms that are used to build attention. The interesting ones that I described to you are essentially output gating and synaptic gating, which are outside of the standard model, so they extend the standard model um, towards using quadratic activations. You remember there were all those quadratic terms. Both output gating and synaptic gating are the fundamental building blocks of the transformer architectures which have been uh, very useful for NLP problems, but I'll show, I've shown you that because they have this uh, permutation invariance property, they're also very good for other kinds of problems, for instance, in physics or of chemistry. And then I've tried to give you a sense of how you can be, begin building a, a more precise mathematical theory of attention capacity and attention uh, mechanisms. And uh, thank you very much. And